Hi and welcome to the show. My guests today were brought together because of one problem, plastic waste. One of them is a man who spent his life in tourism, selling his incredibly successful company, Imagine Travel. The other is a journalist who exposed hospitals in Nakuru, Kenya, who were keeping infants detained until mothers could pay their hospital bills. Together, they're part of Flip Floppy DAO, a project to build a DAO made of recycled plastic flip-flops and sail from Lamu in Kenya to Cape Town in South Africa. Ben Morrison and James Wakibia. Welcome to The Scoop. James, Thank good you. to have you, Ben. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Really, really good to have you guys. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Let's start with early years. James, let's start with you. Yeah. Early years, mm -hmm. born and raised in Nakuru, Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about your childhood, about growing up there. What do you remember? What are your first memories of, of, of Nakuru? I was born in a small village in Rongai district in Nakuru County. Then Nakuru district, Rongai was a division. And uh, those early ages, I was, it was just a village life. It's not town. I didn't know anything to do, in to do with town because I, the first time to go to town, I possibly was in high school for, or from one there. So it was good. The, what did your folks do? Like, what were your parents? Oh, what did your mom, dad, what did they do? My father was a driver, truck driver. My mother was a housewife. Tell me about education in terms of mm -hmm. the emphasis on education. Did your folks, were they really uh, pushing all of you uh, children to get a good education? Did they see the importance of you having a good education? Possibly they would have loved to see me get the best, but uh, their incomes, you know, my mm -hmm. father was a truck driver and the radio he got was just to keep us mm -hmm. alive, you know, food and stuff, not so much of school life. So I went in a small primary school called Matweku, it's a day school in the village, but around when I was in Classic uh, 6, I was taken to a boarding boys primary school called Nechinda in Elbagon. Later I would uh, go to Jomo Kenyatta High School. Not the best, but made, yeah. You may do, yeah. you may do. And, uh, well, we'll move to Ben now in a second, mm -hmm. just because, Ben, you had a completely different sort of upbringing in that you, your folks are from two different backgrounds. You're, you know, you're half Ethiopian and half British. Correct. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. Where were you born exactly and, and a bit about well, your folks? I'm half Ethiopian. My father's Ethiopian. My mother's uh, uh, English. Uh, I think they separated when I was very young. I don't know um, um, the exact details. So I was one year old. My mother retreated back from, um, from Addis where she'd been working and she was in the UK. And uh, she had a call from somebody she'd worked, in, uh, worked with in an NGO and who said, uh, did she want to come to South Sudan uh, with her son? Um, there was a job for her um, just outside Juba. And uh, this was uh, the days before phones, email, she said, let me call you back in 30 minutes. And uh, she went and spoke to, to her parents, my grandparents, and then she rang back 30 minutes later and said, yeah, we can be there in a week's time. <laughs> and uh, she literally very, very brave, I think. And as a parent now, I, I can't imagine uh, um, the decision making around going to a remote part of South Sudan and taking her, her, first, her firstborn um, age, you know, still a, an infant, and she was going to work, so she was going to be leaving me um, in the hands of somebody else. And uh, before we knew it, we were in South Sudan, and that's where I spent uh, the first seven, seven or so years of my life. What, what are your first memories? Obviously, you don't remember Addis Ababa at all, but what are your first memories of South Sudan? Uh, South Sudan is a beautiful, beautiful place, and um, the mixture of Arabic and African that you get in, in Sudan is, is, is wonderful. So my first memories are running uh, around sort of barefoot uh, with a catapult around my neck, uh, trying to shoot lizards or birds, um, pulling my tin car that was made from tin cans through the streets of Juba and the, the small town that we lived. Um, it was a, uh, for, for, as a kid, it was a dream a dream environment to grow up to be. What did you have as a young, young James, young Ben, what were the dreams of a young boy at this point to become, what, what did you want to become? The young boy wanted to be a doctor. Right. But uh, somewhere along the way, uh, my mother got sick, I think, uh, when I was in high school. Got sick and got admitted to, at uh, Nakuru PGH, 
provincial general hospital. Mm -hmm. So when I went there and I saw how she was being treated, and they left the windows not closed, there was so much cold. They would keep requesting for blood samples to test as if my mother was some sort of a giant get so suck all the blood all the time. I really got angry and I hated that profession. So from then on, possibly active incident started growing in me because I began getting angry with how things were, were, were happening. Mm. Yeah. Ben, young Ben, you know, tourism is our, well, the environment, as you said, was only very recently something that came to you. But how did you get into tourism? And you, you not just did, you didn't only do tourism. Tourism because that's what I knew. I knew Kenya, I knew that uh, tourism was what, you know, as a tourist going to the coast in Kenya, that was everything I lived for. Mm. Uh, I followed my heart um, and I was advised by my tutors who, who you know, at, at school, they said, do something you believe in. So I studied tourism. I then was surrounded by maybe other contemporaries and uh, who had uh, more traditional aspirations in the professions. And so for a moment, I managed to let my head and uh, my peers influence me. I thought, let me have a, a respectable job in a traditional, I can see my career path as a lawyer or whatever it be. Luckily, in studying law, which I loved, um, I fortunately saw the light because for me it wouldn't have been the, the perfect uh, uh, career. And uh, I realized actually I should listen to my heart and I realized that uh, the opportunity to do something in Africa, to, to, do, to do with talking to, uh, to people from Europe about Africa, persuading them about the beauty of Kenya, that sort of thing, that was, that was actually something I would happily do without getting paid for. Mm -hmm. So uh, I realized just in time that tourism was the way to go. James, tell me a little bit about moving into the mm -hmm. media space. Did you see the media and communications as a way to get your activism out? As you said, you were upset about how your mum was treated by the doctors in the mm -hmm. hospital. Um, did you see communications and media as the, the route to go down to address some of these uh, problems? Possibly, some subconsciously possibly, but I started uh, loving cameras when I was in classic, so I wanted to be a photographer, mm -hmm. not so much of a journalist per se. Okay. Even when I was going back to the university to study communication and media, it's because there was a unit of photography and uh, there was no school around, unless your school, which I I looked at the figures and I could not manage to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you did look at the, the Mahalo yeah, Foundation? Yeah, I did. I did when I was in Nairobi. Okay. I did and then I decided to go to Egerton University, do communication and media because of photography. Because I believe photography has that, is a good platform to air my, my views, what I see. And who inspired you in terms of photography? I mean, what made you think about photography? Boniface Mwangi. We met mm. even before meeting him. I saw his work online, his awards, CNN awards. Then somehow I got mentored. I felt that uh, with photography I can change. I can, in fact, do the things that I've always wanted to do, like talking about uh, poverty, human rights, mm -hmm. all those things. So I joined Boniface Mwangi. I became an activist. We started going with him in the streets of Nairobi here, protesting uh, what I'm taking. So I was taking pictures, but I'm still protesting. So that's how it came about. And uh, from then, photography has been a very powerful tool because everything I communicate, I use pictures. Yeah. We'll be right back with Ben and James. Stay with me. It's fun. Can I jump on the couch. Aromatic and kumbe yeye ni spice. Entertaining. You remind me of a thing, girl. And that is the African booty. <laughs> it's a beat. Every week we bring you Africa's best acts to your sitting room. Surround yourself with their live performances. <laughs> girl Alain and you're watching Upbeat with my favorite boy Eddie Cavalli. You're my favorite boy. You bring such joy to my world. Hi welcome back. I'm here with Ben and James. Let's talk a little bit about a little bit about Flip Floppy yeah. and the what you're working on now. We've talked a bit about your journeys to get here. Um, tell me a little bit about the actual project and where this idea came from. 
how did you get into plastics? Um, from the year 2013, I've been um, very un I've been angered about uh, how the environment is polluted by plastic. And it is then that I decided that um, I should organize people to sign petitions to present the Nakul County Assembly mm -hmm. so that um, then the dump site would be relocated because I thought the dump site was a problem, not the plastic. But once this is the dump site in Nakuru. Nakuru yeah. dump site. But once I presented the petition to the to the governor's office and they never picked it. And even after um, getting my message, nothing could be done. I narrowed down to plastic because that's what I saw polluting the environment. Plastic being carried from the dump site to the other side of the road, and it was messy. And uh, from then, I started uh, fighting against single-use plastic bags because yeah. that is the biggest problem we have right now. Not all kind of plastic was pet plastic. These ones that carry water have no problem because they are easily recycled. But single-use plastic bags. The this kind is the type of plastic bags you get in the supermarket. Yeah, the shopping bags. Yes. Those ones are nicely branded uh, with all those beautiful names yes. and stuff. And those are the biggest polluters. And uh, it is just a few months now that uh, Ben Morrison called me and uh, told me that I'm doing a beautiful project and they would love that we partner and see how we can address this issue together. Jim, let's go back just a little bit before I get to Ben and how he kind of got into to, to flip floppy. Go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Nakuru County had a problem with you because of this expose that you did on the hospital system. I mentioned it in mm -hmm. the intro yeah. briefly. Mm -hmm. But tell me a little bit about that. You, you saw this kind of cartel at the hospital that was um, holding babies hostage effectively until their parents could clear their bills. I think it's a problem that is affecting all of us because people are so much into money than life. The baby was born and in, in, in difficult conditions. Mm and uh, was at a hospital in Akura. I don't want to mention, mention the hospital because that is, that is gone now. But the hospital could not release the baby because of a, an accumulating bill, which, thanks to them, it was accumulated because of them, because if they had uh, released the baby earlier, the, the bill could not even be above 100,000. But because of them, the bill went to above 530,000. And I, I read the, new, the news article in a newspaper. I called the person who did the, 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 the writer. Yeah. Yeah. I asked her where I could follow up on the article. She told me it's okay. So I asked her for the number to the mother of the kid. The, I called the mother. To, it was around uh, 7 in the evening. I called the mother. I asked her, hi, my name is James, and I'm very perturbed by what I have read. Can I do something? She told me, no problem, you go ahead. I told her, your name is going to be all over and your baby's mm. name is be all over the media. And um, are you comfortable? She told me, it's okay. Then I started tweeting with a hashtag, release baby Jeremy. Within, and within two days, there was a reach about two million people had seen the, the tweet because it was trending in Kenya. And there were all these phone calls and everybody was asking what's happening. Then the county assembly speaker, and I call county assembly speaker, her name is Susan Kehika, called me. I don't know where she got my number. Mm. She told me, Wakibia, we are passing a bill, an emergency fund bill, so that we get money to release that baby from, from that hospital. And within like 24 hours from then, the money was available. She called me again to Wakibia, let's go release that baby from the hospital. We went and released. Later on, I would get another call from a journalist. Nation media journalist called me and told me, we have another problem at another hospital where another baby has been detained. <laughs> so this became your, yeah, your, your because, you were the to-go guy. Yeah, it's something that I don't know. I <laughs> yeah. just, yeah. you know, okay, so I asked him, oh, so what do you want me to do? Just do what, whatever you can Start do. Start another hashtag. Long, because if that baby stays there, she, he's going to die. Because they, it's no heart specialist in that hospital, but they were detaining him because the mother could not raise, raise the money. So I went there pretending to be, to be a staff of the hospital. But I had the camera in, inside my bag, so I went quickly to the ward, took some pictures, faster, faster. Then I left. It, it, again, it was in the evening. I started tweeting, asked guys, guys, tweet. It was uh, 
mm. helped release baby, baby Godwin. It trended the whole night and ne next day. In the morning, I went back to the hospital to check on the baby. I met, um, I don't know who the guy was, and I asked him, can I talk to some management, some, some, somebody from the management? He told me, no, you cannot talk to anybody here. Then I told him, fine, if something happens, don't blame me. Mm. Then somebody passed by, then took my hand, took me to his office, and uh, he told me he's the owner of the hospital. Then he asked me, what do you want? I told him, I want the baby to, re to be referred to Kenyatta National Hospital immediately. He told me that there's a bill. I told him, I don't, I don't, I don't care whether there's bill or not. If they don't have a heart specialist in that hospital, and the baby dies, mm. they should, uh, any, if anything happens, that's their problem. So I gave him some few minutes to write me a report while the baby was detained. And within like half an hour, I had a report fully typed. It was given to me. He never talked to me. I just went. And within half an hour later, the mother of the baby called me. We are in Gilgil, going to Kenyatta, and asked with what ambulance, the hospital ambulance. Have you paid anything? No. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We'll be right back with Ben Morrison and James Wakibia. Stay with me. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Ben Morrison and James Wakibia. Ben, let's go back to Flip Floppy. So, you saw the flip flops on the beach. Is that something that triggered inside you that, you know, now the tourism side is, is one thing, but I need to do something on the environment? How did Flip Floppy it, now um, come, across, come it's apart? It's very specifically to do with uh, where we are, where this is all happening. This is happening in Kenya. And it was just that connection to it happening in, in the place that I had been arranging these holidays to. Um, it started because these flip-flops, I mean, just look at them. They are... This is something you've made from that. This, mm -hmm. These this is were all flip-flops flip -flops that were on a beach in, um, in Kenya about yeah. eight days ago. They were just trash that had, had floated up on the beach. And when you glue them together and you p wash them a little bit, they are really fun. And I think a key part of... Um, how I feel about any, any issues in life in actual fact is I really believe that we have to communicate in a positive way. I really believe that in any environment. I, I try to use that in, in my working life to, to be positive. And I saw these flip-flops as a, a really good opportunity to put a smile on people's faces. Mm -hmm. And this was a real problem. And I've, I think all of us have probably been exposed to environmental campaigning wherever we are in the world. Mm -hmm. But it's normally... Uh, sort of doom and gloom about that there'll be, you know, the same amount of fish life as plastic in the ocean by 2050 and all these statistics. And I thought actually it's more interesting to take these flip-flops, they were bright and fun, and to use those as something to make people smile first and go, oh, what is that? Oh, that's, and create uh, some positive messaging around a really important um, issue. So that's when I started to think about what could I do with these these flip-flops and I thought I'm here I'm in Kenya flip-flops are on the beach I'm looking at the sea and that's when I made the connection straight away what's uh, something that goes in the sea that is is absolutely part of East Africa and 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 uh, the coast and I realized straight away it was simple it actually didn't it wasn't something I thought about in any way it just came to me pretty much in the same moment let's make a Dow from these flip-flops and let's sail some of these flip-flops back to where they came from so these flip-flops, that, that was my next question, is that they're not all originally from Kenya. I mean, it's not people just leaving no. their flip-flops on the beach. These are, these are flip-flops that have come on the tides from, you're saying, as far away as South Africa. South Africa, I found a, a plastic bottle on the beach last week that had come from somewhere called Bhutan in Malaya. Yeah. And it, was a, it looked fresh and clean. It still had water in it. It had floated straight across from Southeast Asia. And some of the largest emitters of marine plastics are from Southeast Asia. And we have a current here in East Africa that is coming straight across um, the Indian Ocean. So probably 50% of the plastic that I was collecting um, and that I was seeing has come from our neighbors um, here in Africa, Tanzania. The currents are bringing it up. But 50% of it probably came from Southeast Asia. Brand names I didn't recognize. Mm. And so I thought it was a really... It's interesting to use that plastic that's come from, from us and from uh, other continents. Let's join it together. This is, this, uh, is a, an issue which is local, but it's actually an issue which is global as well. 
yeah. and um, I thought to a, a sailing vessel, a dhow that moves, uh, it's, it's brilliant to me as a way to send a moving message. It's, it's important here, but it's important in Tanzania and in Mozambique and in South Africa as we go down in our, for our neighbours. But actually the attention I hope that the project gets, I hope it, it can be um, significant for Southeast Asia. Are you sure well. this stuff floats? I mean, obviously it floats to get here, but in mass, is this thing going to actually float once this DAO is ready? There is absolutely no question. We've obviously, I've tested it and so forth, but right. this thing, this, all these flip-flops you're looking at have floated already probably 3,000 kilometers, half of them mm. already. So we know that it floats. Africa is part of that global, that global sort of conversation about um, plastics, already used plastics and recycling. At the moment, this is talked about in, um, in you know, London and all these groups are based in, in San Francisco. But Africa's, Africa needs to be not just sort of part of the conversation, but leading it. So, um, so the important thing is this is a global issue. And yes, we're approaching it locally, but we're, we're, this is Africa talking, talking confidently about this and taking the lead. And people like James are a perfect example of, of how we do that. We, we really take the lead. So um, the, it speaks for itself. That's, you know, I don't need to add words to what this will do when you see this uh, as a 20 meter boat, 20 meters high as well, a sail with covered in all of these plastics. We make the sail from recycled plastics. We won't need to explain. People will just look at it and go, what yeah. is that? And that is, that's not just Kenyans, Africans, or any other geography. It's just people generally will see that as we do this, uh, this build process. They see it come, come to life. And plastic's indestructible. It's the most incredible material. I'm not completely anti-plastics, yes. actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, plastics, if we use them in the right way, are, are brilliant. They're exciting. Um, a plastic bag can last for 500 years. And how long will it take to build this? What's the, what's the sort of time frame you're looking at to build the DAO? Oh, it's going to take quite some time. But uh, we four of months, five months, six months? A, a year to build it. A year, yeah. a year yeah. to yeah. build it. Mm. It'll take us a year to build the DAO. It has uh, to be perfect, you know. Yeah. Well, if you're going to sail on it, it better be perfect, yeah. right? You don't want, I mean, what do you do about pirates? <laughs> have you thought about Somali pirates? Are they going to come for something um, like this? We, <laughs> we have to think about all of this. You know, this is serious as well as fun. Um, yeah. It's fun because that's how we engage. But this is a serious enterprise with, um, with uh, you know, we're going to be on, on this vessel for three and a half months. So we have to be, do, our, do our due diligence about piracy issues. We have to be careful um, to ensure we get the weather windows correct and get the, all the navigation issues. The boat um, is, is uh, we're having consultancy from marine architects and, and, and so forth. So, so, but uh, yeah, the Somali pirates, when we come out of Lamu, we're going to turn right and go quickly uh, south. <laughs> so, uh, we have no problem with that side. The, that stretch is okay. We have yeah. not had complaints. Gentlemen, the show is called The Scoop. I asked my guest to tell me something about them that hopefully nobody in the world knows. So, James, let me start with you. What's your scoop? Uh, I was, uh, sometime, I was a cyclist. I wanted to do professional cycling. Uh -huh. But, and I have, I really practiced every day in the morning. I did everything I could do, but I was knocked several times by, by vehicles. Luckily, I never died. And when I got into my first competition, professional competition, I fell, I fell down terribly bad, and I was carried uh, to a hospital by an ambulance with a fractured leg. And from then, I said, uh, "No more cycling. No more cycling. I would really have loved to be. I can cycle. I'm good. That's what I used to do." But you said, "Let I, me go after should, these hospitals." Yeah. If instead. I <laughs> if I showed you my leg right now, it's full of scars. Yeah. Ben, your scoop. Uh, you got to uh, top that one. So, yeah. <laughs> Something that um, I guess, yeah, nobody really knows is a, a, a passion of mine is for maps. I um, I love maps, and this has come out. This is something that I, you know you don't find that people sort of talk about in you know in the bar or whatever. But I'm really interested in maps, and uh, you know we think of maps as something that are sort of objective things that you look at. But the more you learn about it, and the more you look at a map, you realize that the map is the representation of the person who, who wrote it. And you know, you, a lot of maps you see have, you know, that are made in, let's say, Britain. They have Britain in the center. But you know, if you look at a scale map, you realize you know, Britain's quite small. But if you look at most maps, you might see that they're probably 
scaled up Britain, you know, and you're realizing that, that these are actually just, these are co subjective communication tools. They're a particular person's worldview. Um, I, th I think, um, you know, a lot of maps we're so used to just seeing just a standard map and you forget that. And I, I find them really interesting. I particularly am interested in, in antique maps and to see, to see maps of, uh, of what this continent looked like, for example, in the 1700s. Um, That'd be a very useful skill when it comes to navigating down to South Africa. It's an interest, it's not a skill yet. You have to be working on it. And those are the scoops with James Wakibia and Ben Morrison. Join me again next week when I'll be talking to more great personalities. From me and the entire team of The Scoop from Nairobi, Kenya, thanks for watching. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure and an honor Thank to have you, you on. Thank you, Salim. It's a pleasure. pleasure. Thank really, you. really nice to have you on. What a great journey and good luck with with, with this. You. This is going to be an amazing project. Thank, and, uh, thank you very really much. really looking forward to following up on it. And